Perfect. All right. Um, welcome everyone officially to Fit for Egypt and Greece Travel. Uh, I am Laura Ranieri, and let's get into introductions right away. Here is my lovely co-host for this event. Hi, my name Thanks. My name's Aaron, and I own Vintage Fitness, and I know a lot of you. Um, we do fit, fitness for seniors, personal training, both virtually and in person. And we have an amazing team of health coaches. There's 13 of us that work across the greater Toronto area. If you want a little bit more information, the website's there. It's pretty simple. It's vintagefitness.ca. So you can go on there to, uh, to check it out. And we've partnered with Laura to think through I have this amazing trip I want to go to, but I don't feel confident or strong enough to do it. We can help you get confidence, strength, and balance for your trips. Oh, actually, I have to ask you, Erin, uh, we have a lot. I saw Gail Falkingham. I saw different people, overseas people. Um, do you ever do virtual training with people overseas? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking. We do lots. We are, and we actually have nine languages represented across the training team. So we train in lots of different languages as well. Cool. Awesome. Yes. And I know a lot of people have trained with Aaron and absolutely love it as well. So, okay. And uh, who am I? Some of you may know me, some of you may not. And I chose this shot because, hey, uh, it does take some. Now, I didn't actually have to leap up on that camel. It does kneel down so you can just gently get up on it. But I, I'm Laura Ranieri Roy. And sometimes I like riding camels, sometimes not. Uh, I am an MA Egyptology from the University of Toronto. And I've been to Egypt. This was my 12th trip, 13th. I lose track. I've been to Greece four times. Uh, so I'm a serial traveler. I'm a writer, performer, storyteller, adventurer, animal lover. And my uh, company is Ancient Egypt Alive. We do education and travel. And uh, my, my uh, vision is to spread inspiration and interest in all things ancient history. So that's about me. Okay. There we go. And Amtul Jabin is, is going to be manning all the questions. And I just, here's what we're going to cover today. Um, from my side, I'm going to give you a glimpse of some of the most popular sites of Egypt and Greece, some of the travel experiences you have along the way. And from my side, I'm really going to look at how can you improve your fitness to get the most out of travel? Because you don't just want to go somewhere and not walk up the steps and be worried about how much stamina you have. You want to plan ahead to get fit enough. So when you get to the trip, you just can enjoy everything and not even think about the fitness side of things. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges of touring and the opportunities of touring um, and recommendations from Aaron about it. But I'll also talk to you about really what's involved, how what's involved when you see the pyramids, when you go to the Valley of the Kings, when you go to the Acropolis. We'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the challenges of touring and recommendations from a fitness perspective. What um, exercises should be doing to get ready and what stretches should, should you be doing after you go on all these amazing trips? We're going to take a look at some of the tours I personally have and, and know about and give you some insight. As I say, I'm fresh off the plane from Egypt and I went to Greece last summer. Ask me anything about COVID protocols in both of these countries. And then there's an inspiration piece. Sometimes I find people, you know, we've been stuck uh, with COVID and isolation and people are dreaming of travel, but maybe thinking I'm not confident about going, not confident about my ability to get through the airport and go through all these COVID protocols. So maybe it's just about being a group of inspired travelers that together we, we inspire and give confidence to each other about going on that next exciting trip. Yes, exactly. And and it's interactive. We, we don't want to just be talking at you the whole time. Um, we want your questions. As soon as you have an, a query about fitness or travel or anything, or, you know, did the space aliens build the pyramids? Or I've really got bad knee pain. What do I do? Whatever it is, put it in the chat box. Because we're going to unmute. We're going to do all of that at the end. We've got, and speaking of that, um, Antul, have we got a poll for people? Yes. Let's give it a shot. Let's try it. We're, this is this. We're sort of trying this new bit of a last minute thing. Let's see how this works. I'll launch that. Meanwhile, you can be thinking of all your questions 
for our presentation today. And how is that working? Anything, Amtul, or shall we keep going? Do you need a couple minutes? One one idea is to is to you know do it in the chat. So the question we were going to ask is, what do you most want to get out of this webinar to make sure that we're meeting your needs? So if you wanted to pop in the chat what you're really hoping to get out of the webinar, that would help us uh, in terms of our content. Absolutely. And if we get the polls going later, I'm told, let us know. I'll check in with you later. But uh, there we go. All right. Let's move along. So I wanted to start with everybody's biggest uh, question, I think often about Egypt, I was like, I want to see the pyramids. How do we, how do you see the pyramids? Well, it, it, it's, it's a bit like, um, for those of you, I don't want to be too Toronto centric. Um, if you are from Toronto, Mississauga is a suburb of Toronto. It's about a 20, 30 minute drive from downtown. That's what it's like going to the pyramids from Cairo. You drive and there's nothing like the first time you see these amazing uh, these amazing structures it hit your view. It's so exciting. And it's very interesting because uh, you can actually see if you, have an, if you have an aerial view where sprawling Cairo meets the desert. And the River Nile used to be a lot closer to these pyramids in ancient times, but now we have the city encroaching, the, 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 the suburb of Giza, very busy suburb, and you have the desert and the pyramids. And by the way, there's not three pyramids, there's actually nine. And um, here, just to give you an idea, uh, the main pyramids are for these very important kings. And they lived 4,500 years ago, roughly. We're off sometimes between uh, 150 years in the old kingdom of Egypt, way, way back. I mean, these pyramids were ancient when Tutankhamun lived. So um, we're talking about 2550 BCE with Khufu, then his son Khafre, and his grandson Menkauri building these main structures. But they weren't the first pyramids, but they are the most famous, and they are a joy to see. And if you like, um, you can not only can walk around, you can see these are my own pictures from groups being there in different tours, and you walk around the pyramids. There was a fabulous boat museum, but everything is being uh, changed with the new Grand Egyptian Museum. So the boat, I think, is moving to the new museum, which should open, inshallah, next year. Um, here's my husband. And there's, there's Lorna. Lorna is about 85 years old, and she's going inside the Khufu Pyramid, which is not easy. It is not easy. There's a lot of climbing, but seniors do do it. Most of our tours, the average age, well, the age spans between 50-ish, 45, 50, all the way to 90. We have a lot of seniors come with us, but averages out in the 60s usually. So here is a group. Now, you might not have seen this. This is an older pyramid. It's amazing. It's the, one of the pyramids of Dashur built by the father of Khufu, the father, the ancestor of the ones who built at Giza. Here is a little teaser. go so I hope uh, I hope that whet your appetite for going to the pyramids and kind of a mashup of both the Giza pyramids and the Dashur pyramids and um, uh, I love that image I had in there of the these are all my images brought together through my iPhone but the, the guy the camel telling the guy a, a funny joke I love that picture anyway now here's what it's like to actually crawl inside and let's join Bridget who um, a lady of a certain age is all I'll say a real goer and um, 
you know, she really enjoyed going in the bent. Okay. We're actually going into the bent pyramid. It's only been open for six months. Whoa. Bridget, what's the experience like for you? It's fantastic. And going backwards is an excellent choice. <laughs> and as long as you stay parallel, you're really good. Would you do it over and over again? Yes. Okay, there you go. We have a big fan of the bed pyramid. I would do this again, and now I'm glad there are more lights. Now I can see. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. How are you finding it, Jen? <laughs> um, I'm doing all right. Okay, good to hear. But okay. I kind of wish I was four foot two. Yes, it would be easier to be a pygmy going into this, but it's always an adventure. A real. Indiana Jones style adventure, yes. going into the bent pyramid. And they've oh, we got lights on, really, come on. Okay, so there you go. So just a little view and hopefully that gives you a real experience. Maybe you're never gonna get to, to the Giza pyramids or Dashur, but sometimes I like to go inside. And you don't have to go inside though. That's the beauty, you can do whatever you're up to. It's very accessible to tour these amazing uh, wonders of the world. And here's my husband, Francois, and this lovely lawyer uh, uh, traveled with us. And she wasn't quite up, neither was my my best friend crawling in these pyramids. This is the red pyramid. And there's so much to explore outside. Um, so they had a great time looking around. Also the photo ops, look at the light on the Khufu pyramid when we were there in February, in January, 2020 was, I don't know what you'd call it, transcendent. It was just the whole thing, even without the, the, the beautiful white limestone that's long gone, the, the pyramid just glowed in the February sun. Absolutely beautiful. And I'm showing you one of the, there's all these structures around. You can also explore on even surfaces. Just you can find hieroglyphs in these rocks lying about. It's very exciting. Anyway, Aaron. All right. I was just answering a few chat questions that came up. Um, so how the heck do you train for that? So that, that's pretty intense, right? You're you're at a 90 degree angle. <laughs> you're walking backwards on stairs. So you kind of think through it and really plan for it to be able to be in that type of position. Um, so if you want to scoot to the next slide, uh, Laura. So I'm going to take you through a couple of different training components. So the first is around low back mobility and core strength. That's really going to help. Just let me admit a few people still coming in. Um, then we're going to to go with, uh, balance, especially somatosensory. We'll talk about somatosensory balance versus visual balance. There's one picture there uh, of a client of ours, Tony, who works with us virtually. He lives in Guelph, actually, and uh, he's 84, and he really has been working on his balance through COVID, and the, the difference it makes when you it, say, okay, I want to train balance. It's different than training strength flexibility. You should have a balanced training component to your exercise. I'm going to talk about stamina. Um, how are you going to maintain the days? Like Laura's got energy of 12 people. So how are you going to keep up and go to all these sites and really not just go, but really go with vitality and interest and energy. Um, we'll talk about agility and specifically agility. I'll get into boats, climbing onto boats, what that takes. Cause in Greece specifically, you're probably going to have to get onto a boat, I imagine. And then the last thing is we'll go through leg strength. Uh, there's one picture there, Chester, one of our clients, the man with the mask on, he's doing a seated leg curl with one of our trainers, Bill, who's holding the band on the other side. So there's lots of ways to train your legs either seated or standing. So the first of them, if you want to shift to the next slide there, Laura, is about low back. And we'll do a few of these exercises together. I can see some of you and not others, but if you don't have your camera on, no problem. If you could do it with us, that would be great. The first is brace your core. So this is something you would do definitely if you're going into that kind of pyramid where you're having to go bend over. You would also do it when you're gardening, when you're um, picking something heavy up. For some of you might even just be getting into the car, stepping into a high, high car. Um, almost like someone's punched you in the stomach. So if you do it with me, almost like you're gently, someone's gently punching you in the stomach and you have that brace reflex. 
you should brace your core. So you're still able to breathe. It's not a full contraction. It's just a gentle bracing that really supports your low back. So a lot of these tours in these challenging um, positions, you should be bracing your core. Um, the, there's a lot of seated ways to, to work your core. And if you don't have one, a small dollar store ball or a Pilates ball, um, it, there's a picture there. Wendy, uh, one of our retired trainers is doing that. You're just going to take the ball in your lap and push down and feel your core contract. This is a really easy way just so you can, see, you can see the ball better, um, to work your core without crunching the spine. Doing crunches for most of us is a terrible idea. There's lots of other ways to work your core. So this is an easy seated way that most people can do to work your core with an easy small ball. Um, if you do do that pyramid walk, what's the one that she was walking through? Laura, what's the name of that one? That was, that was the bent. Um, there are varying levels of crouching <laughs> depending okay. on the pyramid. Yeah. Okay. So we'll say we're talking the bent pyramid. You that was a hard one. That do was this. one of the hardest. Yes. <laughs> you want to do this stretch. So she's holding on to a, a, a bar. You could hold on to the to the cur the um, lip of your counter. If you're actually in Greece and you're there with a partner or a friend, you can hold hands and do it with each other. But you just really want to stretch out that low back after being in that position for so long. And the last one I'll do for now is about hip mobility. So what happens when people have low back pain? Often the root cause is lack of mobility in their hips because the hips are a ball and socket joint. And what happens is the ball and socket joint isn't moving well. And the low back says, oh, I'll take over. I'll, I'll do that movement. But it's not meant to do that movement. The hips are meant to do the movement. So that's why you get the injury in the low back. But the cause is the hips. So um, let's do this one again together. It's the picture she's si si sitting with her arm. Oh, you know what? I'm still on the low back one. Oh, uh, yeah. Good. Uh, she, so she's sitting there. We're going to cross the foot over. If you can't get the foot up, that's no problem. You can put it on your ankle. You can take your opposite side. So my left foot is up and, and I can take my left hand and gently open the knee and just get mobility in the hips. This is safe if you've had a hip replacement. That, fine Can I just and tell you, I would do this every day Aaron I really need this like this is wonderful for me I have my right hip and it kills me often so this is great <laughs> oh, hang on so Sorry. let's do it on the other side now so you're going to take the opposite for me that's the right I'm crossing if I can't get my leg up that's no problem I can put it at my ankle taking a nice deep breath sitting up and opening and if you're quite flexible and you find this really easy, you're better than I, that's for sure. But what you can do is lean forward a bit and that will get quite spicy in the hip. And then sitting back up. So this is something um, I would recommend you do every day to really help with your hip mobility. Yep. Over Absolutely. to Laura. Yeah, and I think <laughs> I always find my legs kill me after running in and out of those pyramids as I often do. So stretching during the trip would be important, getting set up with Erin with some exercises you can have to do in your hotel room before and after. They're usually massage therapists at the hotels too. So just, uh, we don't have to just be crawling in and out of pyramids. Oh, sorry about that. I wanted to tell you very exciting news. Look at this. This is just from about a month ago. We went to the pyramids just briefly. It was freaking hot. Don't go in August if you don't like the heat. It's like 40 to 50 degrees. There's a new lounge that just opened with panoramic views of all of the pyramids, very accessible. You drive up this new paved road, you have a lovely lunch. And if you say, you know what, you guys can go and crawl into those pyramids. I'm gonna go have some lovely pyramid rice and some uh, kofta while I look at the pyramids and camels. And you can do that at this new place. That's just open. It's very exciting if you're gonna go there. So moving on from the pyramids is another pyramid. It's the oldest pyramid in Egypt, but it's not just the oldest pyramids. It's the largest necropolis and oldest in the world. If any of you watch uh, do history documentaries, you've seen under the Saqqara sands, all these documentaries, because they're finding dozens and dozens of coffins here these days and mummies. Well, it's an amazing place to tour. You shouldn't miss this area. And most of it is really navigable. This is me from about a month ago again. Look at this nice road. So you can go right up to this newly newly restored step pyramid of Djoser. 
This is about 150 years older than the Giza pyramids. So the very first in Egypt, the first building in stone. But it's not just that. <clears throat> there are all sorts of dozens and dozens of scores of tombs. You can walk right in. There's no crouching. You can see this phenomenal color. This is the causeway of Unas. You can walk along. You can see the different. There's someone with the, there's Bridget who was inside the pyramid with her walking sticks. And underneath the step pyramid, just a year ago, they opened up the chambers and it's a nice even path to go and look at the earliest deep burial chamber of one of the first pharaohs. You just have to make it down these little steps and then it's, it's straight down to see the sites. There's me and my husband, one of the first to go under the step pyramid. But the other tombs are fantastic. If you've never been to Saqqara and seen the reliefs, Believe it or not, they didn't touch any of this up. This is 4,000 year old paint. These are tombs from the fifth and sixth dynasty of Egypt, Egypt's old kingdom. Sometimes you get statuary, <coughs> excuse me, that statuary is there because there's gotta be somewhere for the spirit of the deceased to inhabit if something happens to the body. So they believe they put statues of the deceased individual. So the spirit has a home. If something happens to the body, there is Graciela and her husband enjoying the, the tomb of Maruruka. And there's Maruruka coming out of the walls, the false door to get his offerings. So there you go. Now, one more pyramid. Now get off the pyramid thing. This is the pyramid of Unas. And it's incredible. It's a it's early sixth dynasty period, last of the fifth dynasty, I should say. This is where Egyptian religious beliefs began. It's the first religious text, the first pyramid to have writing inside and long before the Book of the Dead and all of this stuff, this was the first place we find it and then it made its way into other writings. But you do, once again, have to bend down to get through some of these entrances. It's not that hard otherwise. So over to you, Erin. That's great. And uh, did we want a, another poll about oh, travel oh. destinations? Yeah, Our, how is the polls doing, Amtul? Yes, so uh, thank you, Laura. The poll is in the chat box. So I've just put the question and the options and okay. you can either write A, B, C, D or you can write the option for me. Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, Sounds and good. Laura, there's a question that came up. Is there any uh, public transit to go to the Bent Pyramid that's safe for women? Um, 97B, it goes right there. Um, I, you know, that's interesting. I really wouldn't recommend just taking on, taking a public transit to go to Dashur. What you would do if you're not, I would totally recommend, you know, I don't, I'm not the only one who has a tour out there, but I have a very good, well-rated tours with top guides and top tour companies that take care of you. Egypt is not a place to freewheel doing these things. There's lots of traps. There's a lot of getting around the hassle. It's very safe. I feel safer in Egypt than I do in Toronto. I swear to you, I do. But it's not about safety. It's more about navigating the different things you have to have someone taking care of you. I don't suggest doing public transit. What I do suggest is if you are doing it yourself, at least go to your hotel, ask them to set you up with a driver. And you probably should have a driver and a guide that speak English. You need someone to take care of you from the hassle and to navigate all this stuff to get you in there. Don't even look at public transit. It's really not relevant in Egypt. You can make it out there, I guess, to the pyramids. I've never tried it. Usually it's, the, it's a town where you get the driver or you're on an organized tour that makes sure you get, you use your time wisely. You don't have hassle. And that's the best way to do it. If you have any other questions, just email me or we can arrange a call. Great, thanks, Laura. So the next component I'm gonna talk about is balance. It should be a key area to train, especially if you look at some of those pictures, you know, you're going downstairs. Did you notice that they didn't have railings on some of those stairs? The, the, the paths are, are often unstable. Um, so you have to make sure that you have really good balance going in. So a couple of balance exercises that I recommend. One I call walk the line. It's the picture of the woman in the orange shoes. So essentially um, like the drunken walk, you're gonna have something beside you for stability and you're gonna heel toe, heel toe. Um, to really help with balance. If your balance is really far off or a work well, if it came, that's no problem. Just take bigger steps. But that walk the line is a great exercise. 
The one in the middle, not everyone loves going down on the floor. I get it. I get it. But if you're able to go on the floor, I highly recommend bird dog, which is the one um, where she's kneeling. You can put a pillow under your knees if it hurts you to weight bear, or you can do it standing, but it's not as good. Uh, the kneeling one is better in terms of your balance. The reason I like this one is you can actually feel a bit off balance, but you're right close to the ground. So if you're, you're challenging your balance in a pretty safe way, um, another place, great place to do balance training is in the pool. We do a lot of balance training in the pool because the, the risk is you get wet, right? Versus um, having a fall. And the next picture is, I call it toy, toy soldier. It's good for hamstring flexibility and it's also good for balance. So you're just opposite arm, opposite leg lifting. Um, you can use um, something in front of you to help as well. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about for balance is the difference between visual balance and somatosensory balance. So visual balance, and my mom actually is on this webinar and she has this issue and I don't think she'd mind me sharing. Um, her visual balance isn't great. So that, for example, if she's walking down uh, the stairs carrying a laundry bin and she can't see the stairs, she'll get very off balance. So you need to do specific training that um, challenges your somatosensory, so where you are in space. So that could be... Um, putting your eyes down, shifting the eyes side to side for advanced people. It could be closing the eyes. So you do need to have some somatosensory balance exercise as part of your balance training. It shouldn't all be visual with the eyes open. That's why trainers will get you to close your eyes. It's somatosensory balance training. Wow, really interesting. That's great. A lot of the sites do have the railings now, thankfully. So, but not always, you're right, Aaron. So it's good to, to work on that balance. You're not always gonna have that stability or to bring the walking aids. So that's great. Uh, yeah. What else can you uh, do in, in Cairo area, for, for instance? <laughs> or minaret climbing, if you're really daring. Look at the right side of my screen. I'm just wondering if I've got that bar up again. I'm hoping that will go away. Oops, sorry. Um, so do you see this, this minaret at the top right? This is the oldest, second oldest in Cairo. It's very unusual because <coughs> they have an exterior um, uh, uh, stairway up to the top. It's very exciting. The views are fantastic. And look at these ladies. <coughs> these are not exactly um, millennials and they are going for it and they're going up the minaret to get those views. And this is a different mosque. Um, this is one of the, uh, Babzuela, one of the gates, the old gates of Cairo, and here we all are. I'm height phobic, so I did not wanna go up this minaret. It was too scary for me, So, but my husband loves it. And you can get fantastic views. What can you see? Well, there's Georgiana, <coughs> another lady of a certain age who went all the way up and look at the gorgeous view of Cairo you can get if you can climb. For those of you who don't want to, we have these wonderful guides who will tell you stories about the eighth, being in Cairo in the eighth century and these fantastic structures that just exude history, peace, calm, and spirituality. Some of these mosques are very, very powerful to walk through whatever faith uh, or not faith that you have. Very exciting places to explore. But what about Greece? My goodness, I haven't talked about that yet. A little bit of a bias with Egypt because I've been more times than I'm an expert in, in Egypt. I do know my classical history too. And I've been to Greece four times. In fact, um, I had two honeymoons in Greece, my first marriage and now my second. So there you go. And I was there last summer. It's generally vertical, whether you're talking about Athens, the Cycladic Islands, a lot of Greece is up and down. So here's some of my pictures. <clears throat> Excuse me, I did come back with a slight cough. It's not COVID, it's just my cough. I have allergies. So um, here I am in Santorini. Now, this was interesting. We stayed this idyllic place, cliffside. I couldn't believe it, actually. To be honest, I did it on travel points last summer. We had a little plunge pool. It was spectacular. Now, my husband has real knee problems, he's older than me. There was about 65 steps to get down to this you know, accommodation I found on my Be My Remo Rewards set, uh, site, sorry. You have to check these things. And Mykonos was even worse. Mykonos is an extremely vertical island. 
you need help. Oh my God, we could not manage our suitcases. We had to have this buff young guy take 64 steps down and up every day from our beautiful idyllic thing. So I would say you have to be very careful when you go to Greece to choose accommodations with, especially the ones with views and seaside, how accessible is it to get in? Um, you know, even my husband in his 60s had real problems with those stairs. And, and this, these are just some of the realities of Greece traveling. And here's another little quaint mountain village. And these are the kind of stairs and cobblestones that you get. Look at this gorgeous view of Athens. Uh, there's a neighborhood, and I'm going to get the name wrong, Antakofi, Anto, um, that replicates Cycladic villages. And it's on one side, the Monastiraki side of the Acropolis. And it's just so stunning. But as you can see, the Acropolis is up on high. It's the city center. It's where the Parthenon is. So that will also require some climbing, but it is so worth it. It is a beautiful way to spend the morning. And these are the kind of steps. Now, here's two trips that I took. One in 2012, I believe. Lots of people there. And then one in 2015, doing the stairs up to the Acropolis. Just gives you an idea of climbing up. You don't want to do it when it's too hot um, and you just have to be prepared for that. And of course, there's other lovely sites along the way. You can stop and see these incredible uh, ancient theaters like this, uh, this um, sixth century theater of Dionysus. Of course, Athens is the birthplace of drama and which is how I, my first love was Greco-Roman history. And I I got scholarships to university for Latin and Greek, and I, I love classical history very much. And another treat, I'm doing a tour, which may be moved to, to spring of 2023 um, of Athens, Crete and Santorini. And in it, we're including, of course, the Acropolis walking tours, fantastic hotels, and also trip up Lycabitis Hill. And they have a cable car that takes you up there in a very, you don't have to walk it, you wouldn't wanna walk it, but that is the highest viewpoint of Athens, no walking required unless you really want to. Um, but even the, the iconic dining area, the Plaka district is full of uneven surfaces, um, steps, cobblestones. So typical of Europe, right? If any of you travel to Europe, you know, it, it's a lot different than North America in that way, but that's what makes it so charming. And of course the Greek food is like the Egyptian food, fresh and delicious. Um, so very much uh, worth getting in shape to travel there. Um, going on to Crete, our tour uh, that this bespoke tour that I'm planning um, with Georgia Hardy Travel um, will also take you to Crete. And why is because when I've gone to Crete, it's bloody hard to navigate yourself. It's a massive island. It's very complex. It's the largest Greek island. It's very diverse. And there's so much history there. There's, there's fantastic beaches, breathtaking beaches, breathtaking sites, but how do you get there from here? There's the bus, but it's really hard to get to all these historic sites. And that's why I wanted to do a tour there. But, uh, and I really do recommend whether it's mine or another that you get a good tour to explore this island and don't miss it because this is the authentic Greece is Crete. Um, there's four chains of mountains um, our tour goes up into the White Mountains to do private cooking classes. We go hiking and, <clears throat> excuse me, just a view of some of the drives. And I'm pretty good on my hiking and my climbing a bit, but I admit I do have a height phobia. So I'm known to shriek on the Greek uh, mountain passes as I, as I did last time I was in Greece, much to my husband's dismay. It's like, ah, I don't want to do this. it's quite safe. They do have guardrails. And um, it's exciting, but it's, as I say, very vertical destination. And, but this is the reward you get. This is our little hiking trip. There's my husband with his walking sticks. And these are the beautiful mountainous uh, villages. You see goats along the way. I love animals and seeing the goats and all the different uh, animals. Um, the other thing that Crete has that's gorgeous is, is Venice ruled in Crete for quite a few centuries. And there's these beautiful Venetian villages like Rathimno and Kania, where we're staying. And this, uh, this does not require huge physical strength. You can go and stay 
harborside and enjoy the beautiful Venetian architecture and walkways and cuisine in Crete. <coughs> Excuse me, Palace of Knossos. And that is people who travel with me, of course, are interested in history. And this is the, uh, the key site of Minoan civilization. It is incredible. Um, massive site. And this was really, uh, they say this is, there was the labyrinth was actually here where the Minotaur that Theseus slayed was, was underneath this palace. Um, and it's been very well excavated and prepared for tourism. And there's the man, Arthur Evans. It was 1900 that this site was discovered, conserved, put back together again. And it's, it was considered, uh, he actually named the civilization Minoan after the King Minos. And this was King Minos's palace. And they even have the throne from the time of the late Minoan civilization. Stunning reliefs, uh, very massive to explore and evidently very accessible, even for wheelchairs. So here's a fellow who has written <coughs> in Ignosis Palace, I'm a paraplegic wheelchair user. The site's comfortable. You can go through 50% of the site on wooden deck or solid ground. There's an accessible toilet. Interesting place to visit for those who love archaeology and history. Here's another view. Look at the beautiful reliefs. Very characteristic Minoan. It's a little picture of the throne there in the bottom. And I have a vintage video. This is me oh, over 20 years ago uh, with my first husband. And you can't get footage like this anymore. I was filming a half hour travel show when I was hosting a TV show in the 90s, and here we go. About a century ago, Sir Arthur Evans made one of the most important historical discoveries of all times. He unearthed and partially reconstructed the palace of the legendary King Minos. According to mythology, it was here that Theseus slew the dreadful Minotaur. The palace, which was once five stories high with such modern conveniences as flush toilets, was built around the year 2000 BC. You go and that's how I how I like my men. About a century. <laughs> anyway, there you are. Over to you, Erin. <laughs> All right, it's hard to follow that. So the other thing we talked about was stamina. So how do you build stamina? And, and this really should happen before your trip. Uh, the mistake that some people make is they, they have this trip planned and they have they spend a lot of time sitting throughout the day and then just expect um, to be able to have the stamina to keep up with the tour. So you have to build it up slowly and it involves tracking. So what I would do at this point is think, well, how many hours are you currently active? Um, how many steps do you take in a day? How many hours do you spend sitting? And then think through, well, the tour I'm on, you know, if you're going with Laura, I should be able to say, okay, it's, it's about this amount of activity um, that you're going to need to do and build yourself up to that. So when you get to the tour, you're not exhausted because um, that would be such a shame. It's just such a gorgeous sight that, that you'll get to see. So a couple of tips in the planning. You don't want to increase more than 20% per week. So how people get injured is they think, oh my, I'm going away in two weeks and I'm going to walk 5K and I've only walked 1K um, you know, for the last five years, like you're going to get injured. You want to slowly no more than 20% in terms of distance a week. Um, and you want to in introduce a new challenge every week that's linked to your trip. So what kind of trip are you going on? Should you be adding stairs? Do you need to be able to climb stairs without a railing? Are there un uneven surfaces? You need to get to a beach and walk on the beach. Um, are there hills in the trip? Do you need to add hills to your walk? So you can increase stamina by going on your regular walk. That's perfectly fine. But don't keep it the same, same distance, same speed, same route. It's not great for brain health and it's not good for building stamina. You need to increase the challenge in a measured way. So not too much too fast, but just slowly increase, slowly add a hill, add in something that, that creates a bit of a challenge for you to really build your stamina and spend less time sitting. I think you've probably heard sitting is the new smoking. So you don't wanna sit for longer than about 20 minutes um, before getting up and doing something. So just try to be a bit more active and that will help build your stamina over time. And I just wanted to mention, <clears throat> I'm showing a lot of active images, obviously, but uh, our tours, like many, are um, big, comfortable air-conditioned buses are getting you to the sites. 
And there are times if people have had enough, I you know don't wanna to walk to see another pyramid or tomb, you can always go back and sit on the bus. If that, that's enough for me, I'm gonna do two of these, then I'm gonna go back and people do that or they'll go to the cafe or the pyramids lounge or whatever. So we do have that. And it's also one of the climbing things is getting on and off of the bus. And sometimes some of the steps dealing with that too, the, 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 is another consideration. Slide. So getting back to Egypt again, where I, I just uh, got back from um, a week and a half ago, beautiful picture of Aswan. I'm massively in love with Aswan and I want to go and live there forever. Not, not doing it quite yet, but it is a very beautiful area. Um, and there will be areas, these are both pictures from my tours. And one of the beautiful things you do in both Luxor and Aswan and along the Nile is you go on both Feluca sailing boats and little motor boats to get around. And sometimes you do have to walk a little plank to get on them, but the rewards are so beautiful. And of course we have people from their, as I say, from their forties to their nineties and they're managing to get on and off just fine. Everybody gives you, they, you're given a hand to get on. And then look at this, there's our friend Diane and um, Nancy enjoying the view of beautiful boat ride in Aswan. And uh, there you go. And so you can talk to the, and certainly in Greece, you may be getting on and off boats too. Same situation. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so for boats, you know, you don't think about it too much, but what you actually have to be able to do is have the agility to, to step onto something. So you need the power in the back leg uh, and to step onto something that's unstable and moving. So kinetically, you know, there's quite a few components to that. So you need to have the strength, as I mentioned, to forcefully push off that back leg. So that's agility. Um, you need to be able to step down onto something that's rocking and that's lower. Um, and you need the shoulder mobility. So you noticed in Laura's picture, there's all these cords and people will hang on to the cords or to someone's hand and step on. So you need to have the shoulder mobility and the grip strength to hold on. So there is an exercise, and I'll just adjust so you can see my legs better, called rock the boat. And you can do it with a chair in front of you. And you're essentially shifting weight side to side and picking up that opposite foot. So you're just rocking back and forth. And it's a, it's a good, well-named exercise. So you're just here. If, you, if balance is a challenge, you're holding onto the seat and maybe just touching a toe out to start. If balance is really easy for you, you're not holding on and you're just going side to side. Rock the boat. So it's about shifting the weight from side to side and being comfortable. Once you have that, you're going to go forward. Can I take that step forward fast? Do I have the agility to, to push through that back leg? Do it on both sides. Um, and the other one is the shoulder mobility. So this I call drawing your sword. You can do this with or without a band. She is using a band there. Um, you're going to step on the band with one foot and just come across. So it's like you're drawing your sword from your right hip over across. So this is good for shoulder mobility and for posture. So those are two good examples of exercise that will help you get onto a boat confidently. With all these zooms, I put out my my right shoulder. Isn't that awful? Because I've seen all these <laughs> zooms, especially last winter. So I've been working on on flexibility in my in my right shoulder. Everybody needs an errand to keep them fit through these COVID times, I tell you. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> Someone's saying she couldn't see me doing this. So it might just be where, so if you go my, I'm Aaron, if you kind of scroll down the pictures, I'm in a purple shirt. Um, you should see me doing the exercises there. Okay, so leg strength. So we, there's a lot of stairs um, in Egypt and Greece, all over Europe, pretty much anywhere you travel. So the really good exercises and easy ones, you can do sync squats. You see me, up, you see a picture of me doing a sync squat. Every time you make uh, tea or coffee, so you're waiting for your kettle to boil, grab hold of the sink and do a couple of sink squats. So Laura's demonstrating, I'm showing you there, you're holding onto the counter and that helps you get your weight right back. It will make it a lot easier on your knees and you're squatting down and standing back up. So every time you got your tea ready to go and boiling, do you know five, six sink squats. That's really gonna help your, your um, leg strength. 
There's a picture of calf raises there. So holding onto the bar, you're just lifting the heels and lowering the heels. And the bottom picture with the big um, ball underneath, that's a more advanced exercise. I thought I'd show it because it is a great exercise for, for hamstrings. It may not be right for everybody, but if you can get on the ground, you're just pulling the ball in towards you and pushing away. A lot of us are way too weak in the hamstrings, but there will be other hamstring exercises that I'll send you. I'll send a video called Fit for Travel to everybody that attended, and there will be some alternative exercises for your hamstrings. But these, whether you're trying to strengthen for travel or strengthen for your life, I would recommend these three exercises for your legs. That's great, Erin. Thank you. Ah, the joy of being on the Nile. Once you get on that boat, and here we have a picture of one of the Felucas with our handsome Rami and all the lovely ladies enjoying the beautiful Nile. And here we have the beautiful three-night Nile cruise, which is so worth it. Just enjoying the deck. We have a day at leisure, just watching the world float by, like just like Cleopatra and, Ju and Julius Caesar did. 2000 years ago when they honeymooned on the Nile. Just so beautiful. So um, getting on those boats, really worthwhile and getting out there and traveling. Uh, and I just, oh, I just caught, took this video two weeks ago uh, and the Nile at Aswan. This is what it was like on this small bo nature boat ride I took. a soul in sight in August. It was hot, but we did see things like moor hens and ibises. We even saw some water buffaloes taking the water later on. It was, it was so beautiful. And I'm incorporating that in my tours, uh, this particular little trip down the Nile to the first category. But let's talk about temples and historic sites. We talked about the pyramids. Then there's all the great temples. You've heard of Abu Simbel, the greatest temple of Ramses the Great, uh, the temple that was moved block by block when they created the new dam, they had to move this temple. It's unbelievable. Um, these are my pictures. Actually, this is probably online. This is probably Marianne, our traveler's picture here. This is what it's like to go inside. It's easy to tour there. We go there overland, you can fly there. It's very accessible. There's no climbing involved. You can walk right in to the Ramses temple and the Nefertari temple, the two temples there. And so then my a questions just come up in the chat about what the most comfortable time of year to go to Egypt. Oh, not August. Uh, it's uh, definitely any time between October and I would not go later than March. It gets hot by April. So anytime in that it's chilly in December, early January is chilly, uh, but it's still very nice. We went in mid-January last year. Um, 2022, we're going February 14th, so it should be very, very nice. November is ideal, so which is when our, for our, we do have a tour going this November. And here is my favorite temple, the Temple of Dendera, Ptolemaic Temple. Actually, this enormous hypostyle hall was finished by that nasty Tiberius, that Roman emperor. You may have heard of him. Um, nasty fellow, but he built a beautiful temple in Egypt. This was started by Cleopatra, the great Cleopatra's father, and it is gorgeous. It has three levels. Look at the ceilings that the Italians have restored, the colors, the astronomical ceilings. This was the temple of New Year's, the Hathor, temple of the goddess Hathor, and you'll see her face, all that has been defaced, and it's got an upstairs level, and it's got a crypt if you want to crawl down into too, but this is the worn stairs that you would travel to go upstairs to the third level. <clears throat> One of the unique temples we go to, everybody knows the Valley of the Kings where King Tut was buried and others. And I'm happy to say there's varying levels of tombs. You get admission to three when you go in the valley. And we usually check with a group and say, those who wanna be adventurous can go with Laura on the extreme tombs. And those who don't can go say with Francois and these tombs are much easier. But the key ones 
are, are not that hard. You can see there's a few stairs. Sometimes there's a bit of an incline to go down, nothing like those pyramids. And to get to the Valley of the Kings, we get off the bus and then there's these little trains that take you right to the right to the tombs. And that's the same with the Hatshepsut Temple. You get on these little trains and they're quite fun. And you get there this way. And there's the group uh, standing there in the Great Valley of the Kings. And this is what it looks like inside. And here's my husband with one of the tours. You see some of it is quite easy. There's nice banisters. And uh, this is inside, I believe, this was Ramsey's 5-6, gorgeous. Again, all the original color and uh, fantastic. Of course, there's other exciting adventures that you can have along the way. They're optional, uh, but not to be missed. My goodness, we have balloon tours over Luxor and even the oldest people who take our tours don't miss it. You just have to get some help getting into the basket. It takes off, we get up at four in the morning to get the sunrise, you go up, you see the archeological sites from above absolutely beautiful highlight of everyone's tour and we have a lot of people who really enjoy we don't do pyramid writing at the at the pyramids in Giza it's not what we prefer we prefer going with these Bedouins up to the monastery um, of San Simeon which is beautiful to do at sun, sunset uh, lovely Christian monastery going up on camels that are well treated and uh, it's a fun ride whatever your age and physical shape, if you're game for it, we'll make it happen. And so, Laura, you know, another question that's come up for you, is the tomb of Tutankhamun worth seeing? Let me put it this way. I've never been in 12 times. <laughs> I've been to the replica tomb at Carter House. We have a, to, a, a Treasures of Tutankhamun tour in November, 2022. It's the 100th anniversary. It's gonna be very special. We will go. It's a small tomb. They've done a replica tomb. There isn't as much to see, but some people just want to say I've been there, right? Um, so in my opinion, I, I would prefer to spend my time in Ramses 5, 6, the Seti tomb. Um, I will always advise people what I think are amazing tombs. There's so many great ones there. And here we have Rami Darwish, one of our guides. We have the best guides that get rave reviews. And here is Dana and Lorna. And we're going up to the Beni Hassan tombs in the mountain in Middle Egypt, which we're going to be doing in our Treasures of Tutankhamun tour. We go to hidden gem sites and we always have a helping hand and always handsome guides to be there for you. So, uh, so in terms of travel aids, um, what travel aids you should you consider? And there's a question that came up earlier about in the chat about poles. So I would definitely bring walking poles. Um, I would bring ones that have like a rubber nub on the bottom. There's ones such as activator poles. Uh, this is a good example of uh, Laura's husband's using those poles. I think a great idea. Um, they help to improve your posture and just give you a little bit of stability. So I, and, but anything you bring on trip, you practice and train with. So don't dust the poles off, put them in your bag and then take them on trip. Use them before, train with them, then bring them to your trip. And one of our, some of our travelers have those little, uh, maybe you've got them in the next image. Yeah, there you go. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. So the other things you could consider, one is it's like, it's a cane and then it has a built-in seat, um, which is kind of a good idea. I mean, you know, maybe a bit more cumbersome, but if you want a, a, a place to be able to rest anytime that you feel confident, you're like, okay, if I need to sit down or my knees really hurting, or my hips hurting, I would recommend one of those. Um, Laura, you said some of your people bring them and they're really helpful. Yes. And I've seen ones that look a lot less heavy duty than that. Just simple little devices that simply have a seat that come down. Because one of the things that you, is a challenge, it's not so much constantly trekking you know we modify that we moderate that but there are times where the guide is telling stories at the sites and there's not always seats so it comes in very handy if you're in Dendera temple if you're the you know you've got your little seat this you can sit down and listen yeah yeah that's a good point point. and the other one is a small hard ball this is called a tune-up ball but there's you know a, a little any small hard ball like a lacrosse ball um, would work and this is really good if you have if you're tight if you have tight muscles so you can use it for example if you're sitting on a bus for a long time or a plane you can put the ball behind your back 
and massage in. You can lean against the wall and massage in. Um, really good for your calves. So you can put the ball against your calf and really push and just knead. You didn't put it right on a joint, but if you have really tight muscles, um, knots, uh, something like this in your bag is easy and you can just use it at the end of the day um, or during your travel day so that you're loosening up so that you're not so tight the next day that you have a hard time seeing the sights or you're just in a bit of pain. So a small tune-up ball or a small hard ball, um, I would recommend. Wow, I really wish my husband was watching this. I'll have to replay this whole thing <laughs> for him. Okay, excellent. Um, and I was also gonna say, some people have asked me about hearing. If you have issues with hearing, we're um, implementing uh, microphones at some, we do that at the Egyptian Museum, but we may be implementing more and more microphones. We make sure people with hearing issues are up front. So that can also be accommodated for in tours. Um, and then some stretches to think about after your tour. So we talked about massaging, using the ball, just sitting down and just massaging your calf with a little ball, um, especially because any climbing you do on the hill, on the stairs, that's all calf work. So <laughs> I don't know if you know anyone in your family that's ever done all those crazy like tough mudder races and these big buff people that come and climb and do all these crazy things. You know what gives out on them? Their calves. It's interesting because they train their quad, they tra everything's that push ups, their chests are on, and their calves give out. And, and so it's the climbing. You got to make sure your calves are ready for the climbing um, that you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll do on tour. Hamstring stretch. So this is one we can do together. We have D, who's actually on this call, I think, hi, D, um, in showing that picture. So you're sitting on your chair, you are um, extending one leg out and then just reaching, feeling that nice stretch in the back of the leg. This leg, this knee isn't locked out, it's slightly bent. You can do this with a stool by your desk is a good option. So a hamstring stretch is a nice one to do after the tour. And then just a standard chest stretch. So again, we can do this together. You can either grab your hands behind you or you grab the back of your chair. So either or, and then you're just pulling forward and getting this nice stretch through your chest. You're dropping the shoulder so you're not out like this. You're open through the chest. And I'd recommend doing that a few times throughout your travel day, um, either in transit or on tour, just to make sure that your chest and shoulders are nice and loose. Isn't it inspiring everyone to see how fit Dee is? Not gonna <laughs> ask her age, but she looks amazing. I think she would, wouldn't mind me saying she's 79. She's a trainer with us. What? She's how old? 79. Holy cow. There you go. Some inspiration <laughs> for you all. Okay. Erin, you can even take this slide. Um, yeah. So just remember to listen to your body and rest when you need it. So as much as you want to go on these tours and you're on the trip, it, it, overdoing it is, is, is a bad idea. So, you know, these are beautiful slides of people just chilling out in the, in the views and doing what their body um, tells them is, is right for them at the time. So rest when you need to. Now, our lovely friend, I love Dana Kupias from, from um, uh, just outside of Niagara Falls. Oh my God, I've just gone blank on the name. Anyway, she's traveled with us a few times. This pyramid trip, she just didn't feel that well. So we took, she sat and she joined us. She went to our lunch place um, and she was just happy to sit and enjoy the pyramid from a distance and let us do our touring and we all met at her there. So this all can, can happen. If you don't feel up to anymore, you just tell the tour person and they usually make uh, accommodation for you. Here we have lovely restful stops. One of our, we had a little aperitif on the Nile um, with the group uh, before dinner, before we went to the Winter Palace for dinner one trip and it was lovely. And here just people just sitting down. At, I think it's, that was at uh, uh, Medinet Habu Temple, wherever they can, just resting where they want. And uh, let's just talk, uh, we're getting towards the end now. We'll be able to take your questions soon. Um, so so stay, stay with us. But, you know, I just got back from, from Egypt. Last August, I went to Greece. Yes, I'm, I'm insane and I'm still alive. Don't, don't let this cough fool you. I always cough. I've coughed for five years of allergies anyway. Um, but I'm fine. It was, it was great. I'm glad I got away. 
um, travel requirements, double vaccinations with QR code. Uh, you can easily, I had to find a program that made my QR code online. I had to show my vaccination certificate. And then the PCR tests um, uh, are required only to return to Canada when I went to Egypt. They didn't need them to go to Egypt, interestingly. Last year, we didn't have all this stuff with going to Greece, so I just went. Uh, there were always masks on all international and uh, that should say local, fl local flights. And the ferries in Greece required you to have the masks and inside things. Outside, it's fine. Um, and how are the destinations preparing? Well, uh, so for just a few questions from the other slide. One is how much are the PCR tests in Egypt uh -huh. and then any other vaccines needed? No, there are no other vaccines needed. Um, I was so fortunate. I got my, my uh, we exited from Hurghada. We went to the Red Sea after, the, after our trip this year. It was 30 US, really cheap. But we paid to get a special taxi to take us to the health center. That was another $25, $30 each. So it was seamless. They got our results the next day. I'm told with our tours in Luxor, they'll go to the hotel. They'll make it easy for you for $80 US each. That's the latest I've heard. Our tours end in Luxor, so that is Egypt. I'm not sure what the situation is in Greece right now, but I, anyone interested in Greece travel, we're doing a Greece virtual tour on Saturday, and our travel experts should be able to answer that more, more thoroughly. Um, how are they preparing? Are they just letting people go anywhere? No, there's protocols in both countries. So um, incidentally, I went to the Egyptian Museum, and I had like, 10 or 15 minutes alone in that Tutankhamun treasure room with just the guard. There was no one there. The Egyptian museum is crazy. Anyway, masks in place, usually at museums and in, in internal areas. All of the service staff are wearing masks. We had our temperatures checked whenever we went into the hotel. There's no open buffets anymore. I loved uh, this lady, uh, her little small hotel. This is actually Naxos, Greece. And she was just a doll. And she has this fantastic breakfast buffet. Says, no, 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 we serve you. We wear protective gear. Tell us what you want. We will put it on your plate. All of the hotels had protection around their buffets. They had uh, their cutlery in individualized plastic packs. So they're doing what they can. And as I say, it's not with the rigidity you find in some areas in North America, maybe in Britain, but they're, I think they're doing a good job in both countries. So the, the few people have asked um, for some contact information. So I want to get for your next trip. So you, I'm offering a free consultation with a seniors fitness expert. D is an example of one of our team of 13. Um, you can phone this number here, uh, which you can jot down, um, 866-471-0109. You can email me, which is there. It's just Aaron at vintagefitness.ca. And I'd be happy to send you a link for a fit for travel exercise video that I'm putting together. Um, so if you're interested, it might be fun to either do it individually, if you guys have individual trips, or if there's a group that is going on Laura's trip in November, we could do a, a group uh, virtual training. So we could break down, these are the things you have to do. Laura would take us through all of it. And then uh, we would get you ready for that specific trip. It might be kind of fun as well, because if you're traveling on your own, you'd actually get to know some of your uh, co-travelers. So if you're interested so in- you're just, just you know. turning this on me right now. I knew nothing of this. It sounds like a good idea though. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, it just came to me. I thought it was- <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. And I know some, there's some people online who may be traveling with me soon. So that's great. Um, I'm hoping you guys, I know we had some other poll questions. Maybe Antoine's just putting it in the chat to spark dialogue. I haven't looked at the chat, guys. I'm just, so I'll look later. But I, I'm really hoping, I've got this incredible course with a Greek archaeologist guide who is so dynamic and exciting. He's telling the story of the Acropolis, of, of, of King Minos, of the Minotaur, all of this stuff, four weeks starting on sun, this Sunday, it's going to be recorded like this one is. If you can't make 12 noon EDT, uh, we'll send you the link. And again, he's, he's leading tours, but in between, he's giving us this uh, incredible education. It's $60 for four weeks. And I'm so glad to have this guy. His name's Aristotle. How much better can you get? So if you're interested, we'll send the links. Uh, Amtol will put that link in and we'll follow up. 
And I'm leading, of course, with my husband, fresh back from Egypt. This is tricky stuff, the fall of Egypt. People don't talk about, well, what happened at the end of Egyptian civilization? How did it go to Rome or how did it? it well, that's what we're going to take on. It's really exciting when the Nubians ruled, when the Libyans ruled, when the Persians came. Um, so that's starting next Thursdays. It'll be running at two, I believe. And then, for, so for those of you overseas, it'll be like seven or six or seven at night. Um, hope you'll be interested. And we have our free virtual tours, Greece Alive this Saturday, the following Sunday, we have Egypt Alive, links are in the chat. And I'm inviting you, if you want to come, I got, we're seeing if our November tour will go, we're hoping it will, there are people who want to travel. And I'm definitely going next February, and I'm going on the fabulous Tutankhamen tour in November 2022. This is the price range for our Pyramids and Temples tour. It's going to go way up when tourism returns, I think. This is a very good price for a two-week, almost all-inclusive. We do everything for you, all your admissions, many of your meals, not your international air. Um, and it's not, it's like 70, well, actually some people have changed to February now, so our numbers are changing. We get rave reviews. Uh, people, we really take good care of our people. And um, and we also, I'd really like to invite you on this one. This one is so special. We have uh, Barry Kemp will be with us for three days. We just found out he's traveling on the bus for three days with us. He is a, a legend in archaeology. We'll meet Kent Weeks. We're going to to the stay at the Winter Palace where I just stayed. We're going to have a fantastic time. Hopefully, the Grand Egyptian Museum will be open by then. I'm sure. Well, you never know going to be a great tour and that is uh deluxe rooms and we i also have this tour i'm putting together which is a bespoke tour of greece athens crete and santorini questions anyone we'll be sending you all the link and let's chat so a few other questions that came up in the chat um laura one and, and this may be your greece a travel agent that can answer it but what about mixed vaccinations if someone's had two different vaccinations, um, does that qualify? I have, I've had, well, they say it's not really mixed. I had Pfizer and Moderna, so I guess they're the same, but I think that I haven't heard of an issue. You know where I've heard it's an issue? Is France and Germany or something. Maybe you've heard the same thing, but that's a question to bring to our virtual tours if you come. For Egypt, not an issue. For Greece, as far as I know, not an issue, not an issue. Um, and then the name, so your tour company, because you do your virtual with Ancient Egypt Alive, and then you partner with a company to do your actual tours. Yeah. Uh, so what's, it, what's the name of that tour company? It is your journey for Egypt and for Greece. It's wonderful Georgia Hardy tours. But the best thing is just email me any travel questions because I'll be able to best answer. I've been there 12 times. I just got back. And let me figure out what your question is. And if you're interested in the tours, my Egypt tours are through your journey right now. Um, but Ancient Egypt Alive is able to answer all of your questions through our professionals. I just, um, and I have the links to my tours and to, will you put the links to the tours and all the information into the chat for people as well. So if you guys have any questions, feel free either to unmute yourself and ask or, or drop it into the chat. Can you actually see some people for a minute? Um, how do we, let's just see if we can ask to, do we know how to do that to just get people's faces up to say, yeah, if you stop share, it should come up. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Hang on a second. Did I stop share? No, I still see you. No, there oh, you go. I can see people. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Hello, everyone. I want to see who I who I know there, because there's lots of people on. Um, I know lots of names, but please unmute yourself and ask anything if you have a question or I'd love to hear any comments. April, are you ready to travel in a year? I see April there. Maybe she doesn't hear me. Gail, it's so nice to see you. Um, I see... I always feel like romper room and I see Leah yes. and a lot of people I don't know. Well, there's a, there's some vintage people. So we have Serena on the line. 
I have uh, D's on the line. Oh, nice to see all of you guys. Mary Wiseman, good to see you. To unmute and say anything, please, please. We're uh, Laura, Laura um, I went to Egypt 40 years ago. It was wonderful. I've always wanted to go back and I'm going back um, in November 2022. Um, but when I was there last time, I had deli belly from something I ate or drank. Um, and you know, we, we ate in good restaurants, um, in good hotels. Um, I missed the Valley of the Kings uh, and had to go on a private tour the next day. Um, is, is that a problem still? It, you know, we, we, we walked through one of the, um, the, cru the old cruise um, boats on, uh, in Luxor and saw them cutting meat up in a most unhealthy um, manner. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. You know what, I, I've i also had a sickness uh, in Egypt, of course, on my many trips. And um, I really don't think, I, the, we're very careful with our travelers. We stay in four or five star hotels. Um, we recommend certain restaurants, certain dining experiences, but you know what? It's Jeanette, is it? Yeah, speaking? yeah. Um, Jeanette, I always tell people, have uh, probiotics a week before you leave and have mm -hmm. them through the trip. Also, the Egyptian pharmacies are very good. I think don't drink water. I went off the beaten track in Aswan back in 2010 and got sick eating at a restaurant. I don't do that, but I ate at some nice little places that I know are good in Luxor this time, not expensive, expensive, but I know the places. So I think the key is go on a good tour who can guide you mm. and don't take risks with street vendors. I remember getting really sick and doing archeology span in Bulgaria, having one of these cheese buns from a street vendor i was so sick anyway um but yeah don't take risk eat at restaurants that are recommended and probiotics is your best friend too every day yeah thank you yep any other questions hi laura i'm serena yes nice to hi to you. you too quick question um i'm a disabled adult um and with a minor weight issue as well too. Um, I'm not going to Greece or other other places, but I do have a question. Um, next year I'm traveling with my brother for the second time to Italy and they have a lot of cobblestone streets. Um, so I have a lot of issues walking, pardon me, um, over cobblestones. Um, what can I do about that because I am slightly disabled. That is an Aaron question, if I've ever heard one. Yeah, yeah, Serena. So you're you're working with Jennifer now on our team. Um, so what I would do is it the walker, the size of the wheels on your walker, or is it your balance that's giving you problems? Um, Aaron, it's the balance. Okay. So I would have a walking aid with you. So use walking sticks when you go to Italy, because then you'll have something that's a little bit more solid. Um, mm -hmm. And then we should add to your training some in, in unstable surfaces. So we'll find some, some cobblestones in Toronto, maybe the distillery district or something, um, just to kind of have a bit of a practice on that type of surface. Okay, cool. Nice to see you, Serena. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank Anyone you. else? Oh, I can't hear. Someone's talking, I think. <coughs> no, I can't hear either. No, we can't hear. Um, uh, I haven't I had a chance question. to look at the... Sorry, go ahead. I have a question. So on the uh, in the pyramids, you saw the pictures of everyone going down into the pyramid, and you talked about how you go down backwards. So getting out of the pyramid, are you climbing the same stairs out, or is there another path? Well, George, there's no elevator last time I looked. Oh, gee. <laughs> it's the same way out as there is in. And you know, okay. my first Look trip- Look forward to doing it. Yeah. And my first trip in 93, uh, where it was a little bit of Wild West territory, there was the big guard who is holding his hand out when you enter the pyramid for backsheesh. You all know what backsheesh is, tips. And then to get out, he was holding his hand out. Uh, that was back in 93 with not as good a tour, whatever, but um, uh, no, 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 I'm, uh, but definitely you have to be able to climb down and climb back up, but sometimes the climbing back up is, is actually easier, it just depends on the pyramid. 
Are there any areas that it's very, very, very dark in the pyramids or is it well lit? Ish. Uh, the ones that are open for tourism are well lit. Okay. It's all well lit. Yes, they've done a really good job. Kent Weeks, um, who we're going to meet on our Tutankhamun tour, amazing man, who is the Valley of the Kings. Uh, he's Anyway, he's doing a lot of work. He discovered the tomb of Ramsey's sons in the 90s. He launched the balloon tour. Anyway, amazing archaeologist, doing a lot of work to make the tombs in the valley very tourist accessible and also protect them from uh, getting destroyed by humidity and all of this stuff, proper lighting, proper uh, proper railings, safe passages down. So a lot of work has done, been doing, been uh, afoot to clean up Egypt, uh, more tourist. Uh, the whole country is looking fantastic. They're cleaning up the Giza Plateau. There are kaleshes. Uh, on the Giza Plateau there uh, to get around from pyramid to pyramid. There's a lot of, uh, of really good stuff to help, uh, that will help tourism if you're planning to go soon. So does that mean photography is open everywhere or is there places you cannot? Very good question again. So about, it was only in the last couple of years, you can actually use your cell phone in the pyramids, oh, sorry, in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, and you can go in the tombs and you can take your cell phone pictures and they don't bother you. It used to be a big issue. You had to check your cameras. Yes, uh, you can take them into the Egyptian museum. You, there is a fee in some places. They say, you want to take pictures? It's an extra 100 pounds, which is like 15 bucks or so. Or sometimes it's 50 pounds. It's like $5 if you want to take pictures. Yeah, okay. yeah it's Thank now you. much better. Yeah. pictures and video, it's really hard for them to control with cell phones, you know, just, you know, people have their cell phones with them. They can't take all the cell phones. So I guess they, they decided to make it possible. But um, Sadly, the camera I carry looks larger than cell phone. So in that case, you would usually you just get a, in, in most cases, you might say, uh, we had a very good photographers coming on our tours. They just say, here's $50 for my camera thing. And I'm, I'm taking it in and they were pretty much able to go everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So exciting. Um, Aaron, anything more from you? No, no, I don't think so. If you have uh, questions about uh, fit for travel or just general fitness, you want to get stronger, maybe you've been a little bit um, more housebound as all of us have been, <laughs> more sedentary, I'd be more than happy to do a free consult with you and kind of take you through some, some advice, either me or one of my team. So it really lovely to have all of you here. Nice to see your faces or see your names. And um, thank you for taking the time. It was, uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And I'm just looking, I haven't even looked at the at the the chat box so um uh oh okay i think i kept you pretty updated laura oh good actually yeah. it's laura at ancientegyptalive.com i'm just going to put that and i see laura copy but it's my other email but the best email if you have any questions or even want to chat if you're thinking of traveling egyptalive.com there you go and um i will be following up uh, as well with the oh oh hang on a second I'm just going to send everyone there we go wonderful well again thank you so much we should probably call it now but I uh, you know we really enjoyed this time with you and uh, we'll, we'll send an email to follow up I'll send an email just to say would you like to get a bit more information about fitness and you can choose whether that makes sense for you or not I won't bombard you with stuff because I hate that <laughs> So I hope you all have a great afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Thank you all and we will see you soon.